So, so Anna, where do you want to uh, where do you want to begin? Well, I'm going to start off from Germany, from Berlin. Uh, okay. Uh, my, shall I start already? Yeah, go for it. My parents were born in Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey. In 1914, the Turks killed one million Armenians because they were Christian. My parents are Sephardic Jews. When they saw that that million got killed, they ran away from Turkey. They went to Germany because the Germans and the and the Turks were partners in the First World War. Where are your parents originally from? From Istanbul, Turkey. From before that? Well, they, maybe their grand 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 were from Spain, 1492, when they kicked the, the, the Sephardic Jews, the Spanish Jews, yeah. and and Turkey took them. And, but anyway, they got to Germany. And my father liked the German because in 1920 everything was was done. And then he opened up a Persian rock shop, and uh, and they, everybody thought that we were Turks instead of Jewish because uh, my father was uh, you know Sephardic. They didn't look like Orthodox Jews. They looked right. like uh, regular Jews. So anyway, I make it short. In 1933, I was born in 1920. In 1933, I had my mitzvah. So arrived in the temple, everything was okay. But at night, when we had a party at my parents' apartment, somebody knocked on the door. My father opened up and he saw two Nazis with the swine. What the hell is going? What? What? What the hell is going on? My father says, "Must my son Bertie really come on in and have a couple of drinks?" So the two Nazis went in there, and, and they drunk with 20 other people. They, they were Germans and, and, and Turkish, but they didn't look Jewish. Mm -hmm. So they had it run away. So uh, everything was okay till the crystal night. And this is what I, I, I was at two years ago at the Holocaust uh, uh, right here in Miami. And they took us on television. And I, I told him the whole story. We lived in Berlin, where my parents had a beautiful Persian rock shop. We heard all the damages happening on Crystal Night. We heard the windows breaking all over, the crashing noise. We lived on the eighth floor, and we could see on our street that all the stores were destroyed. And you holding us on the road. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. That afternoon, we wanted to my father's store. We walked to my father's store and we saw all the drugs being stolen. A Gestapo agent that knew my father and bought him some drugs. So he made the, the drugs leave. Then he told my father, I'm going to own all the drugs from your store, but I'll make sure you get out of Berlin, go home. We went first to our synagogue. They burned it down. One of our German neighbors said, thank God you are alive. We have friends in another neighborhood who are getting killed. My father, brother, and mother, and sister were in Berlin. We talked to them once, but never again. They all got killed. My mother also had family in Havana, Cuba. They said, don't worry. We just come with fear the immigration. So the afternoon of the crystal night, the Nazi came to our house and told my father, Write down that you gave me your store because I paid for it. You give me all your money from the bank, but but I'm going to get three tickets for you, your wife, your son, to go to Havana. So we wrote that the Nazis was entitled to our store and our money. That was the deal, and that saved our life. Without the money, we would all have gotten killed. The Nazi bought us tickets on a ship called Orinoki, Orinoco, which is the sister ship of the St. Louis. He said we could take our furniture to Havana so we could have something. He drove us to Hamburg in the back of a Mercedes. The ship left the next day. We saw our belongings on the dock. But when my father asked the captain to load it, he said, we didn't pay the German enough to leave. If we paid in Havana, we would send it. He said, we kissed each other and thank God we were on the ship. In Havana, we paid off the immigration officer and got in. Later in Cuba, I was on the pier and I saw the San Luis in 1939 and the uh, Cubans wouldn't let him in and they tried to get to the United States and uh, Roosevelt wouldn't let him get in either and they got back to Europe. One third went to England, they saved and two thirds got killed. So this was the story in Cuba. Now, 
What happened is in 1940, we were two years in Havana. In 1940, finally, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, just to make sure, uh, the, the the United States Consul General, uh -huh. Republic of Cuba, before me, Raul Washington, Vice Consul of the United States of America, duly commissioned and qualified personality, came Norman Hayon, who being duly placed under oath, the post and says as follows. My name is Norman Hayon, and my present home is at Finca Paso Seco, Calabaza, Havana. I was born in March 20th, 1920 in Berlin. I wish to proceed to the United States for permanent residence. But as my citizenship is undetermined, I'm unable to obtain a valid travel for my journey. I, they gave us all the business, my parents and I all, we went to 1940, we got to New York. In 1940, uh, one of my relatives said, you know what, Norman, there is a German place on 86th Street in New York City. I go there and I saw all swastics there. I said, what the hell is going on? This is Germany? This is the United States? It was about July 1940. All of a sudden in the newspaper there was a big sign that says, Fritz Cuban will have a meeting with German American friends at the Madison Square Garden in, in New York. I went there and I saw 10,000 with the swastikas all over. So I said, you know what, I can't take this any longer. So my friend says, you know what, why don't you join the army? And in 1942, all my friends joined the army, and here is what, I have all the papers here. Mr. and Mrs. Caleb Hayon from Anthony Avenue come to see their German-born son, Norman, leave for induction into the U.S. Army. Uh, I'll see this later. But what happened is, because I spoke German, yeah. there's a place in Hagerstown, Maryland, called Camp Ritchie. As a matter of fact, they made a movie out of it. They taught us how to interrogate German prisoners. And, uh, and also, they, they showed us how to how to do encoding, decoding messages. And to make it short, uh, we were there uh, from, uh, I would say, from 19 January of 43 to June of 43. And then, to make it short, they took us on a ship, and on a big ship, we went past Gibraltar. And the first place that we went, Algiers, Algiers. I was with the headquarters of Eisenhower. I was in charge of, here is, court clerk in, in Eisenhower's headquarters in, in, in Algiers. Set codes for converter machine, encoded and decoded messages, operated secret coding machine, which is called Sigaba machine, checked and coded messages, cryptographic technician, encoded and decoded graphic. Anyway, we learned that, and then in, in uh, 1944, we finally, our outfit for 849 Signal Intelligence mm -hmm. moved to Italy, and we got, we got, we took over the Palace of the King in, in, uh, in Naples, Caserta. We took over the Palace. In Italy? In Italy. Naples and the and the, the palace was called Caserta, about an hour away from Naples. So while we are there and inter uh, uh, coding messages, the infantry at Mount Casino captured the, the Germans from Mount Casino. So they said to uh, our head, hey, call these German Jews in, we want to interrogate them. So what happened, we were about 20 of them, we took our jeep and we drove from Naples to Mount Casino. Once we were at Mount Casino, the infantry took about 20 Germans there and said, okay, interrogate them. So I took my 45, I said in German, Hendehol, put the arms up. The ones that went up like that, I said, take your shoulder. That some of them had SS tattooed. We didn't interrogate them. The infantry soldiers took them in the woods but the regular soldiers, we said, Ich bin ein Jude, I'm going to kill you if you don't. I got all the information. That's our, that was our job. So the end of the war. The war ended. The U.S. Army? 
Yes, sure, U.S. Army. I was a military intelligence, U.S. Army. As a matter of fact, it was called... Tell you what, I got everything here. So you're a veteran? 849 Signal Intelligence Service, Mediterranean Theater, U.S. Army. Here, APL 512, U.S. Army. See? Yeah. That was in May 45 when the war was over. Then I was in charge of 400 German prisoners in, in the U.S. P, PW camp. I had the orders to hire. So that was my job. But um, after the war, I had three points here. I'll show you that. Okay, I got three points over here, which means I had 18 points, and uh, the um, they said they said, well, we want you to go to Germany, open up a uh, government uh, with them. I said no, I got 18 points. I'm entitled to get back to this. I want to go back. So October of 1945, I got back to the United States. And that was my story. And what did you do after that one? Well, you? that's on the uh, two weeks after I got out of the army. Uh, my friend says there's a nightclub here in 69th Street in New York City called Vienna Cafe. I got in there, and there were four beautiful girls sitting. I said to her, "May I have this dance?" But I'm dancing to her. I said, "Gee, you got an accent." Oh, I was born in Vienna, Austria. And I said, "Well, I was born in Berlin." So we spoke German, and that's how we got together. How's your wife? In 1945, 1948, we got married. How old were you then? I was 28, and I was married 61 years. So we had a wonderful marriage. I have a son and everything else. And uh, where does your son live? He lives in Boca. And he's an optician. He's there now. I was there a couple of weeks ago at my birthday there. Yeah, 93, but I don't tell anybody how old 69. I am. No, when the woman asked me how old I am, I said, uh, I was born in 1944. And she looks at me and she says, You're 69? Yeah, I love 69. <laughs> I don't tell her the age. Listen, there's so many people that are in the 80s, they don't know I do everything. Your mother knows me exactly the way I am. So that's about it. Okay, I want... Well, right. um, you want to have some pictures or something? Yeah. See?